This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 119. And welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Kevin Moyer. I'm Jamie D. I'm Peter Rios. The Human Torch was denied a bank loan. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of Comic Geek Speak is sponsored by Wild Pig Comics. New Jersey's Wild Pig Comics is celebrating their sixth year, and they're having a 24-hour, uh, they're having their annual 24-hour 50% off sale from noon on Saturday, April 8th to noon on Sunday, April 9th. Every item on the sales floor will be 50% off. 30,000 back issues, uh, thousands of 50-cent books from the 70s to the present, present over 1,000 trades, hundreds of statues, toys, and T-shirts. Also appearing will be Danielle Corsetto of GirlsWithSlingshots.com. Um, they are located at 14th South Michigan Avenue in Kenilworth, New Jersey, minutes from Route 22 East and the Garden State Parkway, exit 138. They are open before, let's see, I'll give you their hours just in case you want to stop in to check out the store before the sale. Sunday 12 to 5, Monday close, Tuesday close, Wednesday 12 to 8, Thursday 4 to 8, Friday 4 to 7, Saturday 11 to 6. Wild Pig Comics was the brainchild of Randy the Mac and Christopher Q. It was an enterprise conceived by two fans dedicated to a radical principle. Clean, affordable, friendly, quality service for an abused and exploited fandom. Wild Pig Comics was utterly obliter obliterated by a flash flood caused by Hurricane Floyd on September 17, 1999. Wild Pig Comics 2 intends to carry on the legacy of its predator and then some. So check out that 50% predecessor, 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 predecessor. What did I predator. say? Predator. <laughs> predator. <laughs> did I say that? Yes. Oh, uh, predator. Uh, <laughs> Let me back up. Uh, all right. So that's... Uh, Advertising our greatest thing. He's a killing machine. <laughs> Corey professionalism right out the window. So that's noon on Saturday, April 8th to noon on Sunday, April 9th. 24 hours. That's got to be cool. I've never been to a comic shop at midnight. You I know. know that's... That that's kind of cool. But I want to get there early because, you know, yeah, I want to get, get there the right pickings. at 12. Yeah, I want to I want to get the pickings. <laughs> I want to um, bum rush the place. Maybe they'll let us in early if we say we're for CDS. <laughs> <laughs> Call them ahead of time. We got a phone number. Yeah, <laughs> we'll send them our list so they can kind of pull the stuff aside. <laughs> this is your pile. This is your pile. This is your pile. They, If you check out episode uh, 118, we did, a along with the sponsorship, we did a short little interview with uh, Chris and uh, Ryan Darth Weasel from our forums. And we'll be bringing them back closer to that uh, the week before that sale. So if you're anywhere in the New Jersey area, Allentown, PA, New, New York, anywhere along that exit, Route 22, whatever, get your asses there. All right. Uh, for this episode, what we have in store for you is a, uh, a variety of interviews that we conducted at the New York Comic Con. And uh, so we're just going to... Play them all through and uh, like a montage. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and you won't hear from us at the end of the episode. So that's right. Bye. So see ya. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> We're out of here. So Sanford, you're drawing Killer Seven. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm doing covers for it. Are you doing just the covers? So how'd you get involved in that? What day is Are you want to do covers? I was like, uh, yeah, let's do it, man. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So this is with a video game, correct? It's like yeah, based off the video game. Based off the game uh, by Capcom. Have you played that game? I played it a couple of times. Um, just to try to get a feel for the character. Yeah, so you would know what it was like. Just kind of get a feel. That's cool. Yeah. You having fun with the project? Yes, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I read the issue one. It was pretty cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, I did like it. Thank you. Are, are you the? Yeah, I I wrote it. So. Oh, you wrote it. All right. Cool. So yeah, I'm you know. I would not. When I got it, I thought I don't know if it's going to be my thing. You yeah. know, Susan sent us a copy to to review, and I thought, oh well, I'm going to read it. It was free, you know, free comics. Right. You got to read it. Yeah. And then I was like, by the end, I was like, okay, I'm ready for issue two. Like okay, Susan, when's issue two? You know, I'm ready. Good. You know, because oh, it was cool. good. It was good, and it's good. totally not normally my thing. But yeah. 
Well, thank you. I'm glad. It gets better, too. So. Good, yeah. I hope, I think. But I'm fine. <laughs> well, obviously, yeah. So how did how does that happen? Like, you know, Capcom says, uh, you know, I guess Josh goes after the license or yeah. something, and then... Yeah, actually, yeah, oh, it's your license. And who are you? I'm David Parks. I own yeah. a Connecticut. Uh, okay, cool. He's Darth Vader, Rolex Stormtrooper. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I actually developed... Uh, I had the license for toys and comic books, so we went, I actually went to Japan to talk to Capcom about what new games they were coming out with, and they showed me the whole seven style license. Cool. So I'm partnered with a Japanese company called Next Plus to help us get the license from Capcom. Awesome. And I knew John because we were working on Micronauts together. Oh, right, right, right. The, the Micronaut revival is going to drop together. Oh, so, uh, right. team up on that. Cool. So how, I mean, and then are there like restrictions with how the story and yeah. versus the game? and you got to stay within certain guidelines. They're giving us freedom to explore different things here, but I mean, but, uh, they had to drop a lot of stuff from the game, so they're letting us kind of play around with it as long as we keep it with it. So the consequences of what, like, the creator wanted. Right. So the creator has to actually approve everything before we go ahead and do it. So that's why the first took a while to get out. Yeah, because you get a lot of back and forth. Yeah, and that's the problem. Yeah, it so always like, is. Yeah. Now, they have to approve every page, every panel, every, everything. Now, does Capcom help uh, promoting the thing? Like, they put little no, things in the back. They, they, they don't, don't do anything. They just take the money. Right. <laughs> and tell us what not to do. Right. Which really sucks. But by virtue of them having the game, that's advertising for you because it, it, it gets the brand recognition out there. Right. But they wanted us to wait to actually the game. After the game came out, we kind of messed up a whole bunch of things. They didn't want any information leaking because it right. was just a big secret thing. Right. So we, we didn't get any information about it until after the game came out. So even though we did uh, the issue zero for the game, we did it from like uh, no information. Wow. We just, we just pretend that like it came through. So the story for one is after the like, but once we had like. Dave, he's got a silver uh, on the somewhere. Well, we wish you uh, good luck with the book. Thanks. What about your name? Brian Deemer. I'm with the uh, Comic Geek Speak podcast. We, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll swap your cards. There. Cool. Got any other projects in the works? Yeah, we're working on two different books and a few different toy lines, too. So we have the second block figures coming out. Yeah, the minor block figures coming out. Uh, we just need to design the new Dragon Fight toys. I can't do the original play along. And we're working on the Dragon Fight Dragon Ball series. Cool. Cool. We got a lot of stuff coming out. <laughs> Good. Have, have, has that book been released on the market that yet? Last week. Last week. So how are sales so far? Do you know? Oh, well, issue one was pretty good. Issue we have dropped for no absolute no reason. Bad. Well, other than it's just issue two, and that's what normally happens. It makes no sense. We're hoping that we should do by maybe. I know. Because there's no reason. Like the retail is like guessing. All right, how many? Yeah. I know. It's it's tough. So, but we're doing. A, I'm working on the iPod version. A long time. So that's a while. Oh, now how are you going to do that? It's going to be... I already started to design it, so it's compatible with the iPhone, so you can, like, scroll through the pages and everything. Really? Right. Interesting. So... So it's not a movie, but it's like a slideshow kind of thing? Or? So I'm working on the iPod, the PSP, and the DVD version a lot at the same time. So, but they just give you the format if you're interested. That's cool. So I'm pretty, somewhat through it, but I'm trying to get some funding so we can actually use the voices from the game characters. Right, right. But right now it's just bubbles. Yeah. Because they want, it seems like they want too much money. But right. Capcom, that was, Capcom was good about getting us in touch with the voice actors from the game. Well, that's cool. But uh, the girl who plays Kaeda, one of the main characters, is uh, now like one of the main people on one of the new Nickelodeon cartoons. So now she's going to be tough to get. Yeah. So, um, but uh, I'm trying to do the voicing, but it, doesn't, it might not work. But I figured it's coming out with the 
PSP version of Metal Gear Solid, you know, big voices. So. Now, is Killer 7 available for the PSP? Uh, no. Or it's only it's just only like PS2 or, or it's Xbox? It's PS2 or? and the GameCube. Oh, okay. So, Alex, we are here at the New York City Comic Con. Yes, we're recording okay. right now. Okay. So you can put on your, your, your radio voice now and... Well, yeah, uh, we're here at New York Comic Con. So it looks like a good show for you so far, has it been? Uh, actually, it's funny, there's a lot of people walking around, but uh, business for us has been actually slower than at a typical show we did. Really? I think maybe it's because it's mostly a superhero crowd, or I think also because it's so crowded, it's actually harder to shop because it's, you know, the aisles are so clogged up that people yeah, don't it, want to stop. Uh, yeah, they're getting a little... But uh, we're doing better today than we did yesterday. Well, that's good, that's good. And uh, overall, have your, have your books been uh, a success? Um, uh, yeah, much to my surprise. Uh, you know, uh, my first book, Box Office Poison, just, they just did a fourth printing of it. And um, the trick went to a second printing. My second book, my second book trick went to a second printing within the, you know, the first year of it coming out. So. My wife, Tasha, uh, read Trick and absolutely loved it. And oh, uh, really? just yesterday, I guess, she bought Box Office Poison. Uh, so she's so she's looking forward to reading that. It's a strange uh, phenomenon for me because Box Office Poison was out for so long and everyone's like, when's Trick coming out? Right. So now there are people actually who have read Trick first and are like, now I'm going to go back and read Box Office Poison. Well, well uh, earlier... Uh, I guess like late summer or early fall, uh, Chris hooked us up with a box of uh, you know um, review uh, copies, review copies yeah. and uh, Trick was in there, so that's when she got the opportunity to read it. So do you have anything you're working on now? Uh, I've actually just started my uh, will hopefully be my third graphic novel. Uh, I'm shooting to have it out in uh, the summer of '07. But, so you're giving uh, yourself enough time, right? Yeah, well, it's going to be thinner than, it's going to be my thinnest, you know, graphic novel to date, only about 100. Now, fine thin, though. Right, well, my first book was 608 pages. The second one was 350 pages. This one I'm aiming for about 150 pages. Oh, so that's a breeze, then. Oh, yeah, I could do it in my sleep, so, uh, so each one gets about the half the length of the previous one, so pretty soon I'm going to be just doing, like, a little pamphlet. Yeah, it'll be like a three-panel story. You got a post-it note. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. Just hand them out to people. Yeah. So now, how has your relationship with Top Shelf been? Uh, it's been great. I have no, uh, you know, complaints about anything. Uh, you know, it's tough. It's, it's, it's you know, it's tough when you're with, with a smaller company. You know, well, com- alternative comics in general sure. are, you know, the, the, there's always problems with small business. You know, you have to take certain things into consideration. But within that context, I don't have any real complaints about it. They, they, one thing they've been very successful at is getting into bookstores, which is part of the reason, you know, when they first we first talked about doing Box Office Poison together, they're like, we're really going to try to get into the bookstore market, and uh, they succeeded in that, so that's, I'm very happy about that. Well, and they're, they're at every single show, and Chris just does an amazing job at, uh, you know, marketing this stuff. Yeah, he's tireless. I mean, I think he does something like 30 shows, and between him and Brett, they do about 30 shows a year. It's amazing. Which is, you know... I do about, when I'm promoting the book, I do about 10 shows a year, and that's exhausting. I can't imagine doing it 20 more times. Well, and the other thing that, I mean, we were really impressed with all the Top Shelf books is the packaging, you know, right. the quality of the covers, the layout designs or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and that just, I think that really helps to sell the book. I mean, you know, part of you does judge a book by its cover, no matter how much you know not to. So having a nice, quality book makes it easier for people to take that leap, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's human nature to sort of, you know, people are attracted to attract pleasant-looking things, and, you know, they're more inclined to pick up a, a, you know, more interesting design than just a generic, you know, a generic, you know, simple image and logo. Right. And that was also another reason why I first went to, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go with Top Shelf is that um, they were much more about that kind of making things look attractive. I think now it's much more common with a lot of other publishers are sort of taking that, you know, because, you know, you got Toronto Quarterly, which does beautiful books, and, yeah. uh, and you can upstart companies like Ad House, which are smaller, and it's sort of like taking the sort of, that sort of top shelf feel, attention to right. the detail, and, and gone with it. 
Well, we wish you uh, the best of luck here at the show, and we look forward to seeing your future works. And it's thank been a you. pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. And, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm here at uh, New York Comic Con with Tim Seeley. Hello, hello. And uh, Tim is responsible uh, for uh, Hack Slash, right? Yeah. Among other things? Among a few things, yeah. The Hack Slash is uh, the one I wrote, and then Spano Caselli draws. Uh, do the first issue, and then we have Rotating Arts. And then uh, drawing Dark Elf Trilogy. Oh, you? that's right. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge around. Salvatore fan. Oh, he's, he's the coolest guy ever. When you meet a person, he doesn't look like he should be a writer. He looks like he should be a, bo- a bouncer. Really? He looks like. <laughs> yeah. He should be a bouncer. Well, I think he might. At one time, he probably was a bouncer. He's got that thick, like, uh, East Coast accent, and he's like a, just like a big dude. Like, you wouldn't yeah. expect that he's, like, writing this flowery, beautiful fantasy stuff, you know? It's like, what? So he's now, a cool guy. If, you're, if you're drawing that, and you're writing Hack Slash, why not just draw your own book? Uh, well, because I'm staff artist and don't do so. You can basically so, tell me to do so whatever. So Josh just says, hey, do this, yeah. and then you just exactly, do it. Exactly, exactly. Right. And on the other hand, like, um, there's something nice about, like, not doing everything, you know? Like, right. I think, because if, if I get a script and I'm like, oh, this sucks ass, then I can do whatever. But, you know, if I can't tell it to myself. You right. Know? So this this way I can kind of do a little bit of changing it up. And I can tell, do something for the artist. Like, I can write something, and they can say, oh, this sucks ass, and change it. You know, so it kind of so it gets it from improving your work by the artist having yeah. an insight into of, it. Yeah, it's kind of fun to do it that way. And it's not so much repetition. Like once you write a script and then you turn around and go draw the script, you're sick of yourself. Right, you're you bored. You hate yourself by that time. So it's kind of cool to get a script in, you know, from for Dark Elf or something, and just take a look at it and be like, cool, I'm drawing this as I'm reading it. And it sounds great, you know. And so I think it's kind of fun to switch it up. But someday, perhaps. Sorry. I'm not sign I'm not really All right. I'm on the inside. But yeah, so, uh, and also, you know, I think the, uh, it might, I don't know if this is a secret, but I think Dark Elf makes more money than Hackflash. I don't know. Yeah, probably just, you know. Just me, you know, just a tad. So. I've forgotten Realm saying a, a couple people have heard of it. Right, right, yeah. right, right. I've heard they might have been at some kind of book list, like where people buy the books and it sells well, like books. I don't know, this New York Times list or something. I, I heard of it in uh, passing. Right. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's why. Actually, I, I think like three or four people here might have heard of it on accident because it was like on a piece of paper that they put their gum on after they were done. <laughs> so that, you know, it's a little bit different, I think. You. Thank you. All right, it's Rob. Hey. So, you need to think something? Yes, I actually didn't even know you were here until she told me. And you got the stickered book. Look at that. Look at that. Sticker tray paper. The post-it. Post-it tray paper. So, she told me it's going to be a movie? Oh, uh, that's that's what I hear. But, uh, you know, that's Hollywood, so. It could it could end up being like, uh, you know, a musical romance. I have no idea what they'll do with it. They might do whatever they want with it, so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Get an autograph favor to ask. Who's my autograph in the back? I thought you were going to see your ass coming <laughs> pointed like this. Oh, like, He's like, hey, now. Went from poop to butt. Right where? Oh, oh, okay. Okay. There you go, sir. Hey, Thanks. Thanks a lot. That looks kind of nice. It looks like I own your bag. <laughs> so they, they lose it. I, I get your bags. That's okay. Thank you. That's how it works. So how's the show been going for you? It's pretty great. I, I can't believe how busy it is. And, like, uh, I think I think the uh, New York fans were, like, starving for a show. Like, it's been so long that they, since they got it, they're just taking a big old ass bite out of it. Like, right. they're, they're just excited. So, I mean, I was coming here this morning. Um, they were turning people away in droves, which made me feel bad because I've never seen that before. Like, yeah. I was just dejected comic fans. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. It's kind of an amazing thing. I hope it stays like this. So. Well, good. I'm glad that uh, you're having a good show. And uh, I actually read... Sorry. No, no. It's no problem. I, I read uh, some hack slash. It's something that I probably never would have picked up because I don't really normally into the horror fan. thing. Yeah. yeah. But my friend Rachel, the girl with the pink hair, yeah. is a huge fan, and she gave me a stack and said, you got to read these. So I read a couple, and then uh, Susan sent us another one, like number three of this uh, doll. So, yes, so I did. And, uh, and I read that, and I was like, wow, I kind of dig this, so I'm kind of looking forward to reading some more. So I like no, no, but kind of, that's good. I mean, I'm not a hardcore <laughs> horror fan, but it's like, it's I'm actually intrigued by the characters now. And then when I, when I read about the movie right thing or whatever, I was like, well, I, I might, I actually think I want to see that if it gets made, you know? So, All right, man, thanks. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that's, hopefully it kind of works that way because, you know, the comics horror is 
sort of second to the superhero game or whatever. So, I mean, you kind of have to appeal to people on as many levels as you can. But there seems to be a good subculture that is springing yeah. around that, and, and I think you have a base of hardcore fans that would Absolutely. follow Hopefully you to they, the end. Yeah, you hope so. Yeah. You can get as many of the, the kooky goth kids, as they call them, on right. Facebook. You can do all right. You know, the, those people that read the Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, they, they might they might take the hack slash. Right. So that's the hope, anyway. That's why there's larks in it. Like, a few laughs here and there. You know, you know, like eating, you know, killing Robert Kirkman, and yeah, you know, which, well, that was really that was just for me. <laughs> that was my own entertainment. That, yeah, that Kentucky son of a bitch deserved to die. <laughs> but no, you can tell him I said that. But no, you know, it's just kind of a fun thing. I loved it when uh, we're at a convention. Like, 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 God damn, see? Right. Well, I love it when you know there's somebody buys that at the convention and it's like picks up the Comic Con cards. Like this is what it was for to be enjoyed while you're at the Comic Con. Right. It makes it perfect. But Great. Well, thank you so much for talking guys. to us, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. And you have a good program, by the way. Well, have you listened to it? Yeah, because uh, Mike Norton is a big fan. He's got his own little crank gang. Right, so, yeah. So I go in there occasionally just yammer. So we listen to uh, your stuff as sort of a uh, basis. Like, okay, these guys do this. We'll just be the rude, really gross version. <laughs> the sort of slacker version. So. Cool. You guys do good stuff. Watch it. All right, so I'm here at the Devil's Do booth with... Uh, Mr. Josh Blaylock, the man responsible for the whole kit and caboodle, is that correct? I, I suppose so. <laughs> so, how, now how long, how many years now that Devil Do's been in business? Um, started the company actually in 99, so uh, we really got on everyone's radar in 2001, so we're nearing the five year mark for that, which is really cool. And you've been uh, partly successful because of your ability to snag uh, high profile uh, um, what it, I just the word I want licenses. The franchise licenses. licenses thank you Tim writing the coattails of pop culture yes <laughs> but now you've uh, you know shaped the company into this um, you know really has an image and uh, most of the employees seem to you know have the same kind of image and the feel and the attitude and, and it seems to really go along with it is that is that do you think that's a true statement um, not that it's artificial just that it's that yeah, the kind of that people that that are made up you know. Well, we didn't try, that's for sure. I like to think that it's, you know, definitely a certain vibe. You know, right. You know, like any company gets a culture in it, you know. Exactly. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, we try to have a good balance of everyone being laid back and, you know, open-minded and everything, and, and, but at the same time very serious about the business side of it and, and uh you know, we're not playing video games in our studio. Yeah. But we know how to. But we're, we'll go out after work and party harder than we probably should. <laughs> so now, now that the company has grown and it's really become a, a big business, were you prepared to handle that business side of it, or, or is it something you just learned along the way? Um, that's. I mean, it's something I wanted my entire life. So I mean, I was. I mean, I, it was. I was. Once you're in the middle of it, though, I mean, there's really no one can teach you how to do it until you're, you know, you just got to do it yourself. I mean, you can learn as much as possible, but, you know, there's nothing that beats the experience. Make some mistakes and then learn from them and go on. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest change that I've really been working on in the last uh, two years has been to structure the company more so, you know, run, runs without me. Yes. You know, I mean, the, uh, like any company starts out with one, you know, one or two people, and then they get some help, and it kind of organically grows, and uh, that's like the common small business formula. And now that I, you know, like to think I know what I'm doing, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's getting a lot more to where you know I, I can be gone from the office for two days, three days, and, it's and all hell doesn't break world. loose. Yeah. Right. And uh, so my ultimate goal is to be the guy that screws things up. You know, that when I come to work, they're like, oh no, what's he doing here? That's a good day, because then you can just go home and relax. Everything runs smoothly until it gets here. That's the goal. So how has the show been for you? I can sit and uh, draw and write whenever I want to. Oh, that's that's always a good ability. The show's been great. I mean, I think they can definitely call it a success. More than you expected? Uh, It's what I was hoping for. I I definitely, uh, I've never seen a show like as packed as it was before. I've never heard of a show selling out. Yeah, that's a first for me, too. I was surprised. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's really cool. Man, I'm really excited. It's nice to have a good show here. Yeah, it's, it's great. Now, you guys are out of Chicago, right? 
Yeah. So are you uh, you have a going to all the major conventions this year? Um, I don't know. There, there's going to be so many shows. It's just like the, the publishers and the creators can't keep up with them all. Right. But uh, we're definitely going to uh, San Diego. We're undecided on the Chicago con. Um, wait, wait, wait. You're in Chicago. It's, isn't it convenient to just head over and, and be there? But it still costs money, right? That's the thing. Like it, it seems silly because we're local, but when we do the math on you know, what we have to recoup in our costs versus what it costs to to go there and everything. It's some shows you can travel to and and spend all this money to go there and recoup everything or recoup enough to where you know right. you're you're good. And then sometimes you can go down the street and it doesn't you know when it all comes down to it, yeah, the travel is an extra expense, but it's like like an extra grand or something like that, you know. Which is not huge in the scope of what those kind of conventions cost. Sure. So um but uh, I mean, we we still might go. I mean, I, I just uh, don't know. But uh, I'm definitely going to Pittsburgh. Uh, oh yeah, good. We're going to be at Pittsburgh. That's uh, April. I'm actually doing a workshop there uh, because I, I have the self the how to self publish kind exactly. of create them coming out, and I'm doing a uh, I'm testing it out and see how it goes to see what the response is. I'm going to have basically a two hour workshop. Uh, if people do have to buy a ticket. To go and I'll just go through all the aspects of, of the publishing side, answer questions that people have, um, kind of follow along what I write, what I'm doing in the book, because it all it all relates, uh, and, and but just on a more you know, personal level, and you know I'm sure there's still lots of things that people are reading that they have a lot of questions about, and, and uh, kind of go over things like the reading the invoices and purchase orders and stuff like that too. So. Uh, that, that's something else I just want to, to dabble in because I'm enjoying doing it. Yeah, how has the response to that book been? Oh, uh, been great so far. I'm getting a lot of weird, uh, like, residual uh, effects from it. Like, the orders are pretty good on it, you know, and it's, I mean, the book doesn't cost anything to make, really, which is great. <laughs> yes. But uh, we're, like, things like I've been contacted by teachers, all these teachers and stuff out of nowhere. And a couple of them mentioned that they saw the dad for that book and then uh, just to talk to their classes. And, and then um, I'm getting... Someone was interviewing me for a, a Chicago newspaper and they mentioned that. Like, it, it seems like... A, it's funny how you kind of make yourself... An, a, you're an authority because you're published, but if you're publishing yourself, <laughs> it, it's like a self-declared thing, but... I finally feel like, you know, I kind of got the realization that I've been doing this for 10 years now, which is quite Yeah. And, uh, but you're doing I comics for a living, so... I've stored in my head that can help other people. <laughs> well, that's great. It's great that you've been able to take it from a from a fantasy to a reality and, and be successful at it and keep a lot of people entertained along the way. I mean, that, that is a business, too. So, I mean, I, I'm not pretending to just be uh, benevolently trying to, you know, help the world or something. You know? Well, sure. But uh, it's, it's just a... It's a nice offshoot from just the day-to-day -day comic books that we're always doing. Absolutely. And it helps out some people. But my goal is to write something that, you know, that if someone else had written it and I was reading it, I'd go, damn, I wish someone had written this when I was trying to, like, to, to start out and made all these crazy mistakes. Because there doesn't seem to be any shortage of people wanting to get started in this business. So... And that's a good thing. Crazy people. That's oh, right, they're that was, mad. That was one thing that was a big, kind of made a little light go off my head about the idea. Hey, this was two years ago at the uh, at the Wizard World Chicago show. We did a panel. I did, I did a volunteer panel uh, on breaking into comics. And we're always doing panels. And, like, sometimes you know, the room will be pretty full and everything. You know, and, you know, like if we go to the G.I. Joe convention, of course, everyone that goes to the show is going yeah. to be in that panel room because that's what they're there for. Uh, but sometimes the panel will be like 10 people, you know. This panel was like 200 people packed. And I was like, okay. That gives you a hint, right? Yeah, this is something worth uh, experimenting with. So. And I like to do it. Let's go. Well, that's great. Well, we wish you the best of luck uh, on your comics and the show and all the future shows. And uh, we'll be sure to be talking to you again soon. And uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. And thank you, Tim. Tim Seeley sitting next to him just uh, finished a sketch for me. It's uh, Drist Orden from the uh, Dark Elf uh, books.
smile for you. That's fantastic. Hits it. That's it's a good, good use of the word, huh? I know. You yeah, know, I mean, use it very often. That's right. Call them Hollywood Tim now. Yeah. <laughs> Now that I'm all Hollywood, please use the word pencil for I appreciate it. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, man. Okay, I'm here at New York Comic Con with Joe Pruitt from Desperado Publishing. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. And uh, how has the show been going for you? It's actually been a really good show. A very big crowd, very uh, good turnout. I uh, didn't know what to expect the first time. Show in a while since we had a, a big one in New York, and uh, so we took, came up, and uh, it's been a little overwhelming. Yeah, yesterday was complete chaos, huh? That's all I hear. Yeah. We got a good crowd at the booth the whole time. That's good, that's good. Um, so tell us just a little bit about uh, Desperado and uh, how it got started and what its mission is. Well, Desperado uh, started about uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we started publishing last January, 2005. Um, I had worked in independent comics for about uh, 10 years, uh, mainly with Caliber Comics, where I started as career director, uh, before moving on to a freelance writing career where I worked mainly on the X-Men titles, Marvel for a few years. Uh, after doing that, took a year off from comics a little burned out. And uh, started thinking about what do I really enjoy about comics, what I really enjoy doing. And I wasn't really writing the creator, uh, the company-owned projects. It was really just being creative. Uh, and also working with a lot of top creative people. Uh, Caliber, one thing we did, it's a, it was a company where you basically kind of started your career and moved on. Uh, when I came to Caliber, my goal was to make it a place where you go get the best creators and bring them to Caliber and say, have fun. Do what you want to do. Do your personal projects. Don't worry. Make your money doing the corporate stuff. Have fun doing what you really want to do. And so when I was rethinking my career, I said, that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy working with the top guys or the new guys and um, say, go at it. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You do what you want to do and have fun. Uh, you won't get rich. You right. make a little something and you get to be creative. And uh, so that's what pretty much that's what I was. It's a home for the creators to be creative. Uh, to own the properties they have. Uh, I'm all about career rights, so they own everything they do for me. Um, they get the, get the money and uh, just have fun doing it. That's fantastic. So, I mean, yeah, you have some, you have Keith Giffen, you have JMD Mateus, and uh, I mean, a whole slew of other people who are, you know, well known, great, creative people. I mean, Keith Giffen's a fountain of creativity, you know, so. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and so, negative burn. Tell us about that. Mega Burns a uh, series I did. I created the Caliber uh, when I was freelance. Uh, it's an anthology title, um, black and white, but it's, it's, it's no, it's not bound by any certain genre or any certain format. Um, when I started Mega Burn back in 1993, I was told it would never go five issues because you have to have it has to be a horror anthology, it has to be a science fiction anthology. That's like nah, I like everything, so I don't think I have to be bound by that rule. So I just made it, you have one issue, you can have a war story, a horror story, a slice of life story, you know, a humor story, whatever. So whatever I thought was quality, I just mix and match. And 50 issues later, I quit on my own terms. <laughs> uh, so when somebody tells me that I can't do anything, uh, it makes you want to do it. Right. Um, so I did 50 issues monthly, uh, 64 pages an issue for the most part. So, uh, five years I did it. And when I started Desperado back up, i be honest, I had no plans to go back to Native Burn because it had this legacy, you know, a lot of big name guys today, you know, start off there or begin the careers with there. You know, Paul Pokes, Brian Bendis, David Max, you know, John Cassidy's, um, all the guys there, but I also always mixed in big name guys like Brian Ballins, Alan Morris, Neil Gaiman's, um, you know, Terry Moore, another new guy who, at the time who was doing stuff with me there. Um, so that's why we always try to mix the big-name guys to sell the book. But what you do is you really develop the young guys. And so when I started making Desperado, I get no attention to doing it, but when I was in San Diego making the announcement for the show, uh, the company, uh, people kept going, well, you going to bring it right burn? I was like, nah, I don't think so. But what, we really miss it. We really, there's no place for that anymore. Comics that nobody has that anymore. And after I thought about it, I said, no. I get a point. I mean, I, the first year at Desperado, since it's my money, my company, I was like, well, I can't take chances on new people. So I just basically go to my friends, the Bernie Wrights, the Brian Bollins, you know, whoever. I said, you know, only go with name recognition because my name's not going to sell the property. And a new name guy's not going to sell the property. So by the first year I spent just using exclusively name people. Second year plan, because I'm still using name people, but I get to work in some of the younger guys. 
And so with negative burn, I get to use as a uh, training ground or a ground to so well, like you're doing a short story negative burn, um, you know, doing a few things here and there, negative burn. Uh, now, the fans trying to recognize you can read our stuff, material, now I can move you on to a project. Now you can be the new artist of this series, or you can do a one-shot here. So I'm just trying to develop younger guys, and I use Nick and Bernie's that vehicle. So now, if a, <coughs> if, a, if a person, you know, wants to take their hand at writing or drawing, and they, and they think they got what it takes... Uh, you have submission guidelines and all that kind of stuff, or, or what's your policy for acquiring this new and? Well, I, I do have submission guidelines. I'm, I'm, I need to post on the web page. Um, we, we rework my website, so that will be posted there soon. Uh, submissions, honestly, uh, we're not a big company. We only have a couple of people staff, uh, so submissions, unfortunately, for, as is most companies, fall to like less priority. Sure. Uh, I do accept submissions. What I prefer is if you're an unknown writer. Um, I suggest try to hook it with an artist who's been, uh, been published or just hook it with a really good artist and send that to me. Uh, as, as I said, my second year plan is going to mix up main writers or artists with up and coming artists and writers. Um, to have two unknowns coming together, it's going to be really tough for me to say, right, today, yes, let's do a project with you. Because again, it's my money and I'm not a rich guy, so I can't sure. take the chance a lot. My third year plan is actually to do more stuff like that. Uh, so the best thing to do as an up-and-comer, do short stories for me. You know, submit stuff make make them Maybe as a writer or as an artist or together. Because I can always you know, put this artist I have here with no writer attachment, but I want to try and get some work. I write it here, I can attach them and make it a burn. Uh, so I, I want to develop and get, you know, get you the chance to like, get published, uh, especially if you're a newcomer. And... Um, and then develop you that way. And then once we get some recognition for you, we can move you into the projects or to the serials and stuff. Great. Well, Joe, we uh, thank you for taking the time to talk no to problem. us. And uh, we wish you the best of luck at the rest of the show and with uh, your business going forward. Great. Thanks a lot. And uh, you know, keep uh, a lookout in the next few weeks before I make some good announcements. Fantastic. We look okay. forward to it. No problem. All right. Okay, we're here, day three, New York Comic Con, and we're here with Mike Gagno, right? Yeah. I got it? Did I yeah, say it? Yeah. You say it. Gagno. Gagno, okay, that's good. Yeah. Open Book Press, and uh, writer and artist, right? Correct? No, uh, no writer, you don't writer on Monkeys and Midgets. Okay. I have done a few uh, illust illustration jobs, comics in the past, but about five years ago. I've been too busy with publishing to do, to do the art again. I do want to get into it again, though. That's awesome. But I've been busy, and I've got so many ideas to write that... It's faster for me to get the ideas out by writing them, getting someone else to draw them. Because I've just, I mean, I've got stuff lined up forever. That's awesome. Okay, now let's talk about where you where you based out of. I'm based out of Kincardine, Ontario. That's where my office is. Um, that's in Canada, obviously. Right. And I'm the co-owner of Open Book Press. Right. My business partner, Chris Campanozzi, he's based in Bayville, New Jersey. So we're a, a North American publisher. We're our small press that's, that's growing, starting to uh, garner a lot of attention. We've got a lot of positive response from things. We've been associated with the 2005 American Music Awards, where we've had graphic novels handed out. Awesome. Uh, this coming Monday, March 5th, uh, a book I wrote, a how-to manual about how to get published and how to work with us, is being handed out at the official viewing party for the Oscars awesome. uh, to uh, an invite-only list of celebrities and things like that that have been uh, either nominees or winners of, of Academy Awards, things like that. So we're hoping to generate interest that way, too. I mean, um, Hey, real, real quick, talk about your bus trip down. <laughs> <laughs> My bus trip down. Um, let's just say it took me 30 hours to get from King Carton to New York Yikes. on a bus, um, which normally should have only taken about maybe 18 hours tops, but uh, <laughs> the bus company kind of, and I won't name any names, but uh, they kind of they screwed up my schedule and they sent me back and forth between a couple major cities in Canada before I crossed the border, and then when we hit Syracuse, there was a huge snowstorm, so we were delayed, so Man. it was... It was quite a trip, but I mean, it was a great experience, and it's it's been fun. I actually spent a little bit of time walking around New York. I, it's the first time I've been here. Cool. Last night, I, I spent some time walking around the streets, and you know, it's, it is a much nicer city than what they portray on yeah. TV and the media. It is. It's been it's been Disneyfied. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it's I, I find it's very similar to Toronto in, in Canada. I used to live in Toronto. Okay. That's where I, I did my education. I did business marketing, and I was I was publishing. Uh, the original line of Smash Comics at the time, and um, yeah, I 
mean, I find that fairly similar. New York, basically, the buildings are taller, but, I mean, it's a very similar Same vibe. Field. and it's, uh, it's a nice city. I'd like to spend some more time down here, for sure. How's it been for the con, for your for your booth and for uh, your books and all that? We're doing fairly well. We've gotten a lot of attention. We've got people coming by saying they've heard about us in the media want to check out stuff. There's a different ob- audience for everything we do. Right. So there are people that are into horror that come here saying they've heard of Cry Wolf and they want to check it out and buy it. People who are into the humor go for Monkey's Images. People who are into fantasy go for, for Graf and Veer. So, I mean, we've got a little bit of something for everybody. Um, and, and we are getting a lot of attention. We've sold a fair number of books. Um, we've also had a lot of visits from some, some bigger name media and, uh, and industry people, which cool. was a very nice surprise. We had, like, uh, Bill Sheens, the head of the book division of Diamond, came by. You know, he came and wanted to talk to us. And we've had people from, like, Entertainment Weekly and, and Pu- cool. Publishers Weekly, stuff like that. So, I mean, uh, it's very positive And, you know, we're very happy to see that we're starting to get a little bit of attention in a very competitive industry. Right. Uh, and, I mean, that's what we got to do. we just got to keep working on it. And we're going to implement a lot of a lot of new improvements to our books, the websites. Uh, we're very excited about our new line of comics. It's going to start shipping in May. Um, they are going to be regular sized, or because I know regular size. Okay. They're going to be comic book size, but they're also going to be perfect bound, like a graphic novel. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking the best things about graphic novels and what works for comic books and putting them together. We're pricing competitively. They're going to range around three ninety nine. So yeah, that's not bad at all, especially when you consider perfect bound uh, small press stuff is usually a little bit pricier. Right. And all of our comics, and this is how it works out. All of our creators tend to make longer than normal comics. <laughs> so, like, most of our comics, instead of being the 22 pages of the ads, are, like, 32, 36, 44 pages of and that's And that's something that we, we always, we, we talk about every now and then. It's like, it shouldn't have to be limited to that. If you if you have a story that you want to tell and it goes 64, 48, yeah. 70, whatever, we, don't put it out, you know, and, yeah. chop, and chop it all chop up. It Just up. get it out there and in I, one format. And I had to learn that hard, too, because when I was doing Smash Comics on my own, I had an amazing script I was so happy with, and I got it made into a one-shot comic, and originally I wrote it to be like 80 pages long, but at the time, we didn't have the budget. I had to cut it down to 32 pages, and that's one thing I, I am going to someday go back and redo that comic with cool. the full script, because, I mean, we I use the best of it, but there's still so much stuff that I, I want people to see. Do you think you're going to come back next year if they, well, they do have, they definitely have another one. They have the dates all set, so you yeah. think you'd come back? I think definitely it's a show we come back for. We've talked to a lot of people about, uh, like the Corgi, I was talking to the guy there. Yeah. I'd like to develop some future potential with them for, for licensing products and things like that. Um, there's lots of potential, lots of lots of good business contacts to make. I mean, New York is a place to go for anybody. Right. So, I mean, definitely, this is another show that we'll probably hit again. Now, what about, um, what other conventions do you think you're hit? You hit anything else? Do you hit, like, Toronto, or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, do the, I do most of the shows in Toronto. We've got the one-day uh, show in Toronto at the Metro Convention Center that's on Front Street. That's on April 10th, I believe. I'd have to double-check the date, but it's a one-day show in April it's got free admission, so I think that's going to be a fairly big show. I'm going to be there. Um, any of the creators of the books going to be at any of these, or I believe Nelson Danielson, my artist for Monkeys and Midgets, and the creator of Rockstar, is going to be yeah. there. Um, we're also going to do Mocha again this year. We're going to have we haven't confirmed the list yet. We're probably going to have Howard Knoll, the creator of Mr. Scoodles, who we've, we've started publishing. He was previously self-published. Cool. We're going to be publishing his entire series and his first, the first issue from Open Book Press is shipping in May. Um, so what, let me ask you this, what, what's like your mission statement? What's like your overall thought or something is, about your book? Is, about the company and stuff? Quality. 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 So we want to give people something good, like, you know, the best quality we can for their money. We want to have good content, good stories. We want to give it to people at a fair price. And that's what the new comic book line is about. I mean, when you compare this to competition, even from the bigger companies, we're you know, there's going to be better quality paper, thicker cover stock, glossier. It's, it's going to be an all-around nicer package for a very competitive price. Cool. We're going to be launching a, uh, some color comics this summer, too. They're all going to range 44 to 52 pages. And so when you get into that area, you're competing with kind of the smaller graphic novels from the bigger companies like Marvel and DC, where right. they start around seven ninety five, and we're going to be in that area, eight ninety five area. So, I mean, we're trying to be, make, make sure things are very competitive. 
tickets and, uh, and get ourselves uh, noticed. And, and the nice thing about it too is the format we're using now, and everything's one shots, mini series, quarterlies. We've got ISBN numbers for all of those, and a lot of people aren't familiar with that, but that's a standard book industry number, and that gives us a huge opportunity to get our comic book line reviewed and distributed by book distributors who normally won't handle comic books in right. traditional format of folded and staple. Right. So that's going to be a big thing. Baker and Taylor is going to be distributing all our comic books to bookstores. That's awesome. So, I mean, that's a place where even, you know, your regular monthly Spider-Man comic cannot get on the rack in the graphic novel section at a bookstore. So that's something we're very much going to develop in the future because the book industry is growing. Library demand for graphic New York novels. Comic Con run by the book by, a, by the book trade. Read for yes. such, I mean, so, yeah. yeah They're sure. taking notice, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a growing industry. When you look at Publishers Weekly has their own comic book uh, newsletter now. Uh, Entertainment Weekly tries to do a review of things every yeah, now and then, yeah. you know, so. I mean, we got you guys. <laughs> ah, nobody's awesome nobody's heard of us. Oh, yes, you have. We're on. not that big. <laughs> yeah. It'll come. It'll yeah. come. Hey, all small steps, all small yeah, steps. That's sure. how we, yep, definitely. No. And we, we tremendously respect anyone in the media who, who takes time to talk to us because we, we do respect the fact that, I mean, you guys only have so much limited time and you've got to do, you know, you've got to talk to the people that you know are going to generate interest. So we appreciate any any moment you spend with us. Hey, we appreciate you guys helping out and sponsoring us as well. That's awesome. We appreciate that. And one of our mission statements is always to expand beyond the, beyond the big two and this is the kind of stuff and that's and that's a good thing to see. And if you look around, I mean, even if you look at industry figures, you can look up with Diamond and with other publications. Small graphic novel and comic publishers are growing. There are more, more coming out every year. And there's a lot of quality stuff. I mean, you walk around the show here. Oh yeah. And there's some amazing stuff that I mean, there's a lot of good up and coming stuff coming out. And it's definitely an industry we want to be a part of. Good. You know what? That's great. I think that we're going to end it there. Yeah, right. Thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of the Sunday. I will. Uh, looks like it's not as busy as it was yesterday, which is, you know, yeah. good for walking. Maybe not good for business, but good for walking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and being able to get back in. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It won't be pulling people out with the fire marshal. Oh, man. Like and here's to a safe 30-hour uh, trip home. <laughs> I hope Hopefully not. Hopefully it won't be as long on the way back. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're here, day three, New York Comic Con. This is Peter and Jamie, Comic Geek Speaker. And we're talking to Jamal Eigel. Hi, how you going? doing? Nice Good, to meet man. you, man. Nice he actually, you too. he actually almost assaulted us in the, on the, in the <laughs> aisle. <laughs> yeah, this guy comes up, hits me in the back, says, "We'll see you in Pittsburgh," and I'm like, "Okay." Like, hey, <laughs> well, the T-shirt helps. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> so uh, let's just start off. Um, your experience in New York Comic Con. How's it been? It's been great, actually. It's been. This is a. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what the turnout was going to be, and since we haven't had a big show of this scale in like 10 years, you know, it, right. I wasn't sure if people would really be responding, because usually it's either like uh, Big Apple Comic Con, which is run over at the Penn Pavilion, and it's, you know, a tiny little space, and there's, you know, it's like a Turkish market, it's just too many people, and it gets hot and sweaty, and, you know. <laughs> And let me, wait, just been, let, me, let me interrupt because yeah. I totally didn't even introduce you. You're the current artist of Firestorm. Yes, I am. And uh, I got to tell you, I, I've been following that book since issue one. Jamie has as well, too? Yep, it? yep. since issue one. And I'm a big fan of Criss Cross. I yeah. really am. And so am I. That's and when you jumped on the book, there was just something about it that clicked for me. And I, I just you. have to thank you about that. And I'm actually looking at Firestorm 23, the one year later. One year later. And uh, it looks sweet. All right, sorry. Not to interrupt, but I, I realized that. They have no idea. I'm working on three and a half hours sleep. So. Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Hi. Say hello. How are you? He's doing a little meet and greet now. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> All right. So New York Comic Con. Yes, New York. He's, he's getting that big. He's a star, man. <laughs> Now they're friends. It's okay. Cool. <laughs> so um, it's been good. I know it was crazy yesterday with the, the attendance, but oh, oh man, I just unbelievable. The, when was the last time you heard about people having to be turned away from a show? No, I, never. I, I, it's tough. You know, I mean that's but that's New York. That's right. like that's exactly why we've needed a show like this here for so people long. People were hungry for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So um, let me see. Let's uh, hold on. Let me think here. <laughs> so Firestorm. Yeah. You're enjoying the work? I am loving the work. I, you know, I'm 
Stuart is such a talented writer that it's, Stuart just, Moore. it's so much yeah. fun. Just reading, like when I start laughing while I'm reading one of his scripts, right? Because he's just he's got this like subtle humor. You know, I'm more I'm more of a slapstick kind of guy in general. I laugh at the worst things. You know? <laughs> My favorite comedian is Jim Norton. You know, that I'm just you know I just have this really bizarre sense of humor. But I'm also like a big fan of like the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy, awesome. and Abbott and Costello. And you're you're, you're playing in my ballpark. Exactly, you know, and you know, but Stewart is just he's, got, he's so subtle, and you know, like the stuff that's funny is genuinely funny, and it's in there, and it's just it's great. Does know? any of, does any of that inform your work at any oh, absolutely, time? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, I I kind of have to because it's like a more of a mainstream superhero book. I kind of have to like tone down the the. There's a part of my brain that just wants to do wild takes and just like really biz, you know bizarre. You know, almost like for even further than like Kevin McGuire style, <laughs> you know, facial reaction. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, again, I, I end up having to play it a lot more subtle, you know, but it's still an action book and there's still a lot going on and there's so many layers to each story. Right. Yeah. You know? And which was great because when they told me that Stuart was coming on board initially, he was the last person I would have thought of to be writing a superhero book, you mm-hmm. know. And he's just completely, I was so impressed with, like, the first two scripts. And I just, you know, we talk all the time, and it's just a great collaboration. So let me let me ask, because I know some of our listeners are going to want to know, what's it like being on a book, mm. and then all of a sudden you got a big event, Infinite Crisis. Right. Now you got this whole thing where one year later where you got to jump ahead. Does that change your sensibilities? Did you guys know about it ahead of time, coming into we knew it? About it we knew about it ahead of time. We knew, we knew that... Uh, we were coming into it, but we also had a very, you know, general plan, and I guess, you know, a lot of your, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm going to make the assumption that your listeners have already read Firestorm 21 and 22. Okay. Um, I came on the book with issue 8. And so, so consider this a possible spoiler right, warning. This is a possible, <laughs> spoiler warning, spoiler warning, spoiler warning. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So, I came on the book with issue 8, and from the, the moment that I came on the book, we had one plan. Bring back Martin Stein. Nice. Okay. Which I saw on the latest yeah. the one issue. Yeah. Change the costume. Bring back Martin Stein. Tie up, tie up a lot of the loose ends. Now, why Martin Stein and not Ronnie Raymond? Like, wouldn't that be an interesting switch to make Ronnie because, Raymond the? Well, we brought back we brought back Ronnie, and uh, you know, I, I make the caveat that I am a Ronnie fan, mm-hmm. and you know, I grew up on Firestorm. Oh, like yeah, so did I. Yeah. Everybody else. Um, but Ronnie by himself. If, if Ronnie were teamed up with a younger character, if Jason were more of a scientist than he is, Jason, Jason Rush, he's he's one of us. He, you know, he's a comic book geek. He collects toys. He hangs out. You know, he watches movies all the time. Right. You know? And that was like the the big thing. If you remember the beginning of the series, you know, the, the first shots in issue one is his buddy Mick playing with a Martian Manhunter action figure. This right. is and talking about you know going to a con. This is this, this is the stuff that Jason's into. So it it really doesn't make sense to have you know to. Kind of similar characters. Makes sense, yep. You know, yep. together. Whereas Martin brings the scientific knowledge, plus he brings the experience of having been Firestorm for so long. And, you know, there's a certain amount of awa- you know, awareness of the bigger picture that he has now because of his time in space. Right. You know, right. So I, you know, and just having an older character filling sort of the emotional void for Jason that he doesn't have the, 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 like the closest that he doesn't have with his father, with his father right yeah, yeah. father figure he's like exactly, exactly. which yeah. is going to probably create an interesting dynamic down Absolutely. the road I can imagine yeah. it's one of those things that we're definitely going to be exploring in the series that's awesome uh, how cool what is, was it to shape some of the design work and I came again issue 8 I came into this book with like sketches in hand of like because one of the things they were talking about they wanted to get away, not really get away from Ronnie's look, because Jason basically has Ronnie's costume, minus right. the, had Ronnie's costume minus the puffy sleeves and with the, the the original facial tattoos, and we wanted to kind of get away from that. We wanted to, you know, you know, up you know upgrade but pay homage at the same time. So the new costume is basically Ronnie Raymond meets Tron. Yeah, yeah, you know, that worked. I see it. 
And we got the puffy sleeves back. Got the puffy sleeves back, you know. But now we've got, you know, you're you're gonna see you're gonna see the costume do th- do things itself, you know. That, you know, I don't want to really spoil it. No, no, it's but, fine. Yeah. You know, if you if you look, we're oh. on. We're, we're looking at issue 23 yeah, here. We're looking at issue 23. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, so nice. it's going to be, you know, stuff like that, you know, you're going to, you know, the, the suit is more utilitarian now, it's more, you know, it has more functions, you know, it's, you know, enhanced to increase the efficiency of his powers, it's also has, it's going to have other little tricks going on. That's it, it great. Al- and uh, not to take it, it almost looks like a powering type thing where... The kind of, is, but we didn't want to go too yeah, far but, with but it. where the suit is more... Uh, more a character now than it was before. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's, you know, we wanted, you know, part of what we were going for is we wanted a more like, military kind of look to it, you know. We wanted, you know, you know, it's kind of, you know, he's kind of been, in my head, you know, when designing it, you know, he kind of saw, you know, how Jordan during Infinite Crisis <laughs> said, whoa, that looks cool, you know, maybe I could put a little bit of, I see that. A little, even subconsciously kind of putting a little bit of that, you know. But again, it's all, what we were about now is we got a lot of complaints initially that we were you know, kind of casting everything that was Firestorm aside, you know, for sake of story. But now, because everybody on the t- on our team is a fan of the original of the first two series and big fans of, of Ronnie and Jason, you know, acknowledging Ronnie, acknowledging the contribution that Ronnie has made to the series, the, acknowledging the history of Ronnie and Martin and Mikhail, you know, and Jama and right. you know, and everything, and putting it all in the book. I mean, think about it. You know, Kyle Rayner took a beating when he first came out. Absolutely. And look at Absolutely. how many years later, and now he's got a fan base. And, he's, and got, he's got a fan base, but he's still, you know, every so often you still see those guys who are just like, you know, Kyle should never have been a Green Lantern. They should have called him something else. We get we get a few of those. You know what? But he's been so around, and, and, it, and it proves that you can have the two of them coexisting, so... I think it's great. Well, I think one of the differences between that situation and the one that we have is, you know, Jason's gone. You know, Hal was always a presence in, in a DC universe. Right. Either as Parallax or as a Spectre. You mean so Ronnie's he, gone. Ronnie's gone. Well, Ronnie's yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ronnie's, sorry. That's Ronnie's right. gone. And, you know, but Hal was always around. You know, there was That's never... That's true. Yeah. There, there was never this, like, you know... It was a very clear line that Hal Jordan was never going, it was always going to be, you know, in the DC universe. Right. You know, yeah. Because enough people like his character, but they wanted to try and do something different. And sometimes that's what it's all about, is trying to do different things, trying to bring newer readers, newer readers in. I mean, you will have not believed how many people that I will meet and talk to online and meet at shows who will say... Never had started reading comic books again recently. You know, I've dropped out for a long time. You know, started reading, picked up the new Firestorm, love it. You know, have no idea what what happened before this <laughs> series, but you know, that's yeah, right. You know, but you know, love what you're doing. You know, and even like a lot of people, we even have people who were resistant to the book initially, who are like slowly coming around, slowly like embracing Firestorm, you know, embracing Jason, and you know, and embracing the series. Where do you hail from originally? I am a New Yorker. I'm, oh, I am nice. born and raised in New York. Okay. You know, with a few side trips to LA and West Virginia and you know various. So other you, you told us you're gonna hit. You're gonna be in Pittsburgh, right? I'm gonna be in Pittsburgh. Where else are you gonna be? I will be. I just booked my uh, hotel room for San Diego, so I'll be in San Diego. Um, Heroes Con. Nice. In, uh, in Charlotte. Nice. I might. I'm doing the uh, the East Coast Black uh, Comic Book Convention in Philly. In, cool. uh, in May at, um, at Temple University and oh, I think cool. I may be doing Wizard World Philly also nice and uh, can we talk about your exclusive yes absolutely. Oh, talk about your DC exclusive absolutely. great I'm, absolutely. Uh, congratulations thank by you. the way thank you thank and uh, talk about that what's that what's, in, what's um, the it's plan a, it's a two year exclusive um, basically I won't be doing anything for Marvel for a while <laughs> and uh it's a nice, it's a nice deal. Yeah. Primarily Firestorm. Anything uh, else primarily covers Firestorm. or anything? We're, we're talking. I'm, Don't yeah, we're say talking anything about that you covers, can't say. We're talking about various other things. We're talking about a particular character that I've been waiting to get my hands on for my entire career. Nice. And you know, we'll we, look, we will see. We will see. I don't really want to say anything. No, I know. I, we totally I understand. Don't want to jinx it, we but totally understand. The, the plan is to be. The plan is to be on Firestorm for a long time to come. Awesome. Well, 
we thank you so much for no you know tackling us in the in the aisle. We appreciate that. And we did, actually admitting you're a fan. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, that's kind of that's, that's that's a little bit of a geek moment for us. So we will definitely get in contact. We'll bring you on the show for a longer interview. Absolutely. Get absolutely. your career based uh, career and your your uh, resume and all that. No and just talk some comics. Okay, all right. Man. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right, so I'm here at the Marvel booth at New York Comic Con with CB Sabolski. How you doing, CB? Doing really good. Doing really good. Recovering from a trying to recover, I guess, from a busy weekend and winding yeah. down, you know, and a couple of late nights. Huh? Yeah, some of which you guys were a part of. That's I right. Hope you had a good time. Yeah, everything has been a blast. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, when we when <laughs> when last we spoke, you uh, you mentioned a bunch of stuff you're working on, but you missed a few things. Yes, I did. I did miss a few things. I appreciate you giving me a chance to talk about them. Uh, two of the projects that I I forgot to mention were my uh, Untold Tales of DP7 one shot. It's coming out in April. Uh, it's just revisiting the DP classic new universe, DP7 universe. Uh, and this is for the whole you know, revitalization of the, of the new universe that they're doing, right? Yeah, this is leading up to it. These are just basically Untold Tales, which uh, are set in the in somewhere in the past, of the, in the first 18 issue arc, the run of first 18 issues. And uh, my particular story takes place between DP7, 4, and 5. And it reintroduces the characters and tells an untold tale that you know of what they were doing back back then at that time. So, cool. And then uh, the second one I forgot to mention was uh, it's uh, X Men Unlimited 13, I believe. I did a Colossus Iliana story and uh, something I'm really proud of. Mine start here, sir. No. Uh, I don't know where the line starts. I'm sorry. Are you on line? Uh, no, no, I'm no. doing an interview right now. I apologize. Yeah, that's quite all right. All right. <laughs> I just, just want to get online. I didn't mean to bother you. No, 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 Here, Why don't you come through here? You want to see Omi? Sure. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, X Men Unlimited 13. <laughs> And uh, David Aha did the art, and uh, David Aha is a Spanish artist with a multitude of styles, and he did this one in a kind of a darker, you know, heavy black kind of Mignola, Frank Miller style, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, Frank the Armada colored it, it looks fantastic. Great. And um, one thing I guess I could bring up, and I guess it was kind of a secret, but Joe Casada announced it his panel yesterday so I could talk about it. Oh, great. And uh, not too many places have picked up on it, so, you know, here at Comic Geek Speak, we could talk about it. <laughs> uh, I'm not Ed Brubaker, and I'm not Warren Ellis, so many fans are probably going to be disappointed, but I am the writer of the Dakota North series with oh, fantastic. Laura McCubbin. So. That'll be great. And and, uh, and it, is that an ongoing miniseries? With the... It's a five-issue series. Uh, it hasn't been scheduled yet. Uh, Lauren and I are working on it now. Our editor is John Barber. He's fantastic. Um, this came about by a weird series of circumstances. I think on the podcast I talked about my whole thing with my career now is take it really slow, like try to work on you know lower tier characters and the stuff that I loved when I was a kid. And Dakota right. is a series I love. Yeah. And uh, when I originally was looking for a project for Lauren, she doesn't really get into superheroes, so I said, oh, you should think about doing Dakota North with her. And John Barber was like, oh my God, that's my favorite series when I was a kid. I can't believe you brought that up. That would be perfect for her. And I was like, great. And I was about to leave her. He's like, are you a fan? I was like, yeah, I like Dakota North. He's like, you want to pitch for it? Or, you want to pitch for it? He's like, you're a fan? You know, he's like, John, he's like a lot of my writing so far. He's my editor on Magniverse. He's like, I'd love to hear if you got a pitch. Went home, thought about it. I pitched the next day. And Dan Buckley and Joe Clutt is happy to be around. They love the pitch. And it all worked out. And it's a little nerve-wracking now, though, because we thought it was just going to be like an under-the-radar kind of right. slow-start kind of miniseries. And there's been such a huge response online to this Code of North, you know, announcement that it's, I've been like, oh, no, now I'm under the under the gun. I knew it really was going to be in a lot of trouble when uh, Laura McCubbin was out at WonderCon. She said, like, eight gazillion people came up and asked her, you know, who's writing Dakota North? Who's writing Dakota North? <laughs> Even Jim Lee, of all people, who have to who's right to go to North. I'm like, oh, boy. Well, now, now you're a big shot. <laughs> yeah, I hope I'm not a letdown, no. no. I'm really happy with the way the story is, is turning out, and I think people are going to really like it. It stays really true to the essence of the character, but kind of brings her back into the spotlight. And uh, just by complete coincidence, this is the same time that Brew was thinking about using her in Daredevil, and now she's back in Daredevil, too. So Brew Baker and I are really working closely together to keep her modern adventures kind of set. Great. Well, I'm looking together. forward to checking that out for sure. Cool. All right, CB. Well, well, thank, thank you so much for, for uh, uh, yeah, for, for enlightening us on your upcoming drinks. projects. Yeah. And uh, right, uh, yeah, please go. Don't forget to pick up your free manga. How does that work? Can you edit stuff like that out? Or? No, I 
actually. You're just going to let it run? I'm going to let it run because it adds character. It's the show floor. Everybody knows it's chaotic, you know?